Welcome back to Tom's World Scale Model Series. In this episode, we undertake the construction of our Maniac Panther Tank Destroyer. If you enjoy programming on scale modeling, then show your support by subscribing to this channel. Leave us a comment, like, dislike, or share the video with friends. Clicking the notification bell gives you alerts when we post new content. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a friendly visit for a complete list of all our videos. Our unboxing revealed a beautifully detailed and cast kit consistent with the other main models we built on the series. The photo etch and clear parts were nice additions, but the multi-part individual track links with separate guide horns meant we were in for a few tedious hours of cleanup and assembly. Still, with a little patience and perseverance, we were able to whip the parts into a beautiful specimen of this fear tank hunter. So stay with us as we undertake the building phase of our Mang Yang Panther project. I built the Tamiya Yak Panther a few years ago and remember being really pleased how the vehicle looked once built and painted. To my eye, the Yak Panther has always been one of the best looking fighting vehicles of World War II. And since our main kit is even more detailed than Tamiya's, I couldn't wait to see the finished product. At project start, we have to decide which variant to build since the kit contains parts for and allows us to build both the early and late versions. I decided to build sort of a hybrid using parts from both versions which had aspects that look good to me. If we want to be historically accurate, we'll want to keep an eye out for these grey numbers as the instructions as we build guide us through which parts to use for which variant. The Panther platform has a lot of wheels and we get to them immediately in step 1. Note the poly caps, a feature often seen in Tamiya armor kits as well. Each idler builds up with 5 pieces. The idler wheel halves didn't fit snugly together and at first it appears that the poly caps were too wide. But the culprit was actually a little flash on the inside of the idler hub so we have to remove the flash to get a snug fit. And here are all the wheels cleaned up. We'll set these aside and paint them prior to assembly. The hull builds up with separate parts. There's no bathtub style hull here. Also throughout the build, the instructions call for drilling holes and we want to do this before the part is installed. We must follow the directions carefully since the holes are very unspecific. Many of the details on this kit come separate. Here we see the bump stops, final drives and reservoir covers that need installing. Simpler kits usually mold these details on. In our unboxing episode, I'd stated that the kit contains different swing arms for the different variants. This was wrong since both variants use the same swing arms, but the swing arms do come in three variations as we see here. In these close-ups of real panther swing arms, we can see three slightly different forms, some beefier than others, likely designed such by engineers due to uneven stresses that are put on the arms when the vehicle is running. The instructions tell us which arms to place where. We also notice these weird inserts that slip into each arm. We'll come back to these in a moment. Mang sells separate optional kits which allow us to give our Yag Panther workable torsion suspension. These kits contain workable tracks, track pins, mounts for the torsion wire and metal rods for the torsion bars. The swing arms have a slot into which the ends of the torsion rods slip into. Also, the inside of the hull bottom has these little posts, which if installed keep the little torsion rods aligned. 
Since we're not installing the torsion suspension, we have to install parts A4. These parts are keyed so our swing arms sit at the proper angle once installed. If we're not using the suspension kit, we have to insert these little filler pieces into each swing arm. Here's how they look when in place. Once installed, despite the keys, there's a little play in the swing arms. Before the glue dries, we want to place the model on a flat surface and press the arms down. This ensures our model sits flat and doesn't wobble once the wheels are installed. Here we see how the swing arms are offset to accommodate the torsion bars. Note the port side arms trail forward, with the starboard arms trailing rearward. The keys in the mounting brackets help us get the correct orientation of the arms. Step 5 installs cooling fan details beneath the engine grills. The engine air intake grills on the deck are large and we can see through them, so we'll have to pre-paint the engine cooling fans so we can seal them into the hull. If we're entering our model in a contest, we want to make sure these details behind the engine grill are finished, with no raw plastic visible. Unlike many other kits which come with a one-piece superstructure, the main kit builds up with a substructure. The glacis plate and casement sides get attached over top. The substructure helps us to get the outer pieces aligned. Our jack builds up with several small parts, and it's indicative of the level of engineering, intricacy, and the associated work that's involved with this kit. But the payoff is a beautifully finished piece that oozes with detail. Time to tackle the tracks! As we saw in our unboxing episode, each track link builds up with three separate parts, and admittedly, when seeing the separate guide horns, my heart sank. With 174 links and 348 guide horns to assemble, some builders may want to invest in aftermarket pre-dressed tracks. But all was willing to sacrifice ourselves for our viewers here on Tom's World, we just dove in. If we take on building the tracks out of the box, be prepared for a few solitary hours of track dressing, quiet introspection, and life contemplation. When attaching the guide horns, we want to make sure that they're perpendicular with the link. Otherwise, when assembled, they won't track properly with our interleaved wheels. And here's our little pile of anguish all cleaned up and assembled. Step 10 has us drill more holes, this time in the glacis and superstructure sides. Again, we must be careful to drill the holes corresponding to the variance we're building. It's important to get the hole sizes and their placement correct. It was a bit tricky for us since we're building a mix of variant parts. The larger holes are for the tool attachments and the smaller ones are for our PE tie down details. In case we drill a hole by accident, let's look at how we can fill it. We start by jamming a little oversized styrene round stock or stretch sprue into the hole so it sits snugly. We then flood the joint with thin model glue. We make sure to let the glue dry completely, it takes about 2 hours. Then we slice off the excess with a knife. Then we finish by sanding the plug so it sits flush. Since the plug fits snugly and the model glue sort of welds it in place, once sanded, the repair is barely noticeable. Once painted, it'll disappear completely. The glacis and superstructure sides fit snugly over top the substructure. This dry fit shows how tightly the parts fit together. Once we glue and press the parts together, we'll have a tight joint. Elastic bands came in handy to hold the superstructure pieces together tightly as our glue dries. Jumping ahead a little, here are the parts that make up our gun barrel. The barrel length comes as a single solid piece, but like most models, we do get parts that are split, like the gun sleeve. Whenever building up split parts, we want to make sure there's no seam line. To accomplish this, we smear on thick bodied model glue on the contact surfaces, using a little more glue than usual. We make sure we have a good even layer of the glue. We then clamp the pieces together tightly. Once the glue is completely dry in about 2 hours, we see some of the melted plastic is oozed out of the joint. This is exactly what we're looking for. We just have to make sure the glue is completely dry, so the bead is hard. We need only sand the bead down, and we can see that the seam totally disappears, and we didn't have to use any filler. Once built up, the gun looks awesome. The muzzle brake comes in one piece, so we don't have to clean up any ugly seams that are usually associated with the troublesome two-part versions that come in some kits. The gun's breech and stem are also very detailed, built up with over 20 parts. 
Quite a few tiny parts come in this kit and we see some of them here in the gun detail. There's one issue with the gun stem that we need to take care of. On the inside of the stem where the barrel gets slipped into, there's a knockout remnant. We have to remove this odd bit otherwise we won't be able to attach the gun barrel. This little tab on the barrel, that slips into this square hole in the sleeve. The knockout remnant, now removed, is located here so we can see how it would prevent our barrel from slipping into the stem. The breech also looks great once assembled. I accidentally broke off one of the recoil shock absorber rods so it was replaced with a short length of white styrene round stock. If you're depicting your model with open hatches, it's a good idea to paint the stem and breech. Many steps in the instructions have us attaching dozens of detail parts. These are mostly grab handles, tools, bins, various hooks, mounting brackets and other doodads. This is also where we find out if our hole drilling was done accurately. One trouble spot we encountered were these PE flashing pieces with four being attached on each side. These are long narrow brass pieces which require a lengthwise bend very near to their edge. This is a difficult bend and a photo edge bender would definitely come in handy. I looked at buying one but at $50 to $120 they're a little rich for us here at Tom's World so I decided to make the flashing out of styrene. I had this sheet styrene in 0.4 millimeter thickness in my stash. It was a smidgen too thick but close enough. We start by cutting out an oversized piece. We can use a straight edge and a box cutter with a fresh blade to make our cuts. We then very lightly score the piece lengthwise about 3 millimeter from the edge making sure our line is parallel to the edge. For the next step we'll use this scriber, in this case a dental pick. Airplane modelers use similar tools to scribe panel lines. The end of the tool is ground into a wedge shaped point. We then lightly draw the scriber over our score line. We're looking for that little curly bit of material that gets removed. We can then gently bend the piece along our score line. We can then trim our pieces to their final dimensions. I found these rough dimensions work well. We can determine the length using the PE pieces as a guide. We can then clamp the pieces into our desired L shape using clothespins. We then flood the inside of the joint with thin model glue and keep the part clamped up for about an hour. And here's the finished piece. The PE flashing pieces have tiny bolt head details on them. To make these, we'll use thin slices of 0.8 mm styrene round stock. And here's how the bolt heads look once attached. And here are the pieces once attached to the hull. These flashing strips were made of thin sheet steel on the real vehicle, so the little dents and deformations on our pieces look convincingly real. One cool feature of this kit are the workable two-leaf hatches. If we're careful with our glue placement, the hatches open and close freely. The kit also features a movable ball mount hull machine gun and the main gun traverses and elevates. The kit comes with a short length of braided metal wire which I originally thought was our towing cable. It's actually the wire that gets wrapped around the spool that's mounted on the hull. To our consternation, the kit contained no towing cabling. Luckily I had this picture hanging wire in my stash. Most hardware stores sell it in different sizes. It's essentially a tiny version of real tank towing cable so it looks very realistic. Luckily, the diameter of our hanging wire fit perfectly in the plastic tow cable loops. We can then flood thin CA glue into the joint to affix the wire to the loop. And here are the finished tow cables ready to paint. With our major sub-assemblies complete and with most of our parts cleaned up, we're ready to start painting. Some builders like to fully assemble their models first, but I like pre-painting. That gives me greater control and I find that painting the attachments like the tools is much easier when they're not attached. There's no right or wrong way and we use whatever method works best for us. We'll be handling the model quite a bit, so we'll attach our clear parts and the rest of the photo etch detail just prior to painting. That way we won't damage or break them off by accident.
And that'll do it for this episode. Check back soon for the next installment as we paint and weather a Jagdpanther tank hunter. If you haven't already, why not subscribe to the channel? Otherwise, leave us a like or dislike, share the video, or feel free to grumble in the comments. Or visit the channel Tom's World for a complete list of all our educational and entertaining videos. In the meantime, keep your firing position camouflaged and ammo bin full. Stay well and all the best.